I'm just going to go through a few examples. We're going to start with a full blood count. This first patient was a 37-year-old mother of two boys. And we noticed this. Now, this is not a particularly large drop in haemoglobin, but it is a drop. Now, the question is, does it represent random noise, biological variation, or is it suggestive of a possible pathology? So then moving down here, we have a look at the MCV, the mean cell volume, the average size of the red blood cells. Still well within normal limits, only a very subtle reduction. But is it suggestive of something? Uh, as we all know, a smaller red blood cell size can, in some cases, suggest an iron deficiency. So this is what small red blood cells look like. Uh, the middle column there is standard size, and on the left in this, uh, we're not there yet, but they're sort of moving to a small size. That's what we call microcytosis. Now, just as an aside, it's worth noting that if you do have iron deficiency, or thalassemia, that will lead to a change in your HbA1c, a false change. So if you have iron deficiency, your red blood cells turn over less frequently. So that means that those red blood cells live longer and they're exposed to sugar in the circulation for longer. So that will lead to an artificial elevation of your HbA1c. If you have thalassemia, another condition that can cause microcytosis, the red blood cells will turn over more frequently. So you'll end up with an artificially lowered HbA1c. So that's just as a wee bit of an aside. So after we've had a look at MCV, I find this RDW is very useful. Now this stands for red cell distribution width. And this basically measures the variability in the distribution of the red blood cells size. And this is important because if you have a lot of small cells and a lot of big cells, they'll average out. So your mean cell volume, your average red blood cell size will still be the same. But an RDW will help you identify this problem. And this patient, you can see her RDW, her red cell distribution, went up. And this is a graphical representation. So you can see that all the cells there look pretty close in size. And in the graph down the bottom, there's not a great deal of variation. And you can see the mean cell volume is sitting at about 90. Whereas if you have an increased red cell distribution width, you can see the graph on the bottom is flatter and graphically the cells appear to be quite varied in size. Now, any hematinic deficiency, so any of the essential nutrients for red blood cells, iron, B12 or folate, will cause an increase in RDW. But it tends to be iron deficiency that causes the most profound increase. So in this lady here, we've seen three hematological findings that would suggest the possibility of an iron deficiency. So we'll bear that in mind. Now just as an aside, don't ever ignore the RDW. As you can see from this graph here, once your RDW goes up above 10 or 12, all-cause mortality starts to increase quite significantly. And while some labs might use 12 or 14 percent as their upper limit for their normal reference range, there's one lab in Sydney that will actually use 17 as the uh, upper limit. And that's probably where about the risk seems to plateau with a, a relative risk of 10 times in your all-cause mortality. So I would argue that 17 is probably a little bit high. So let's come back to our patient who had these three hematological markers suggestive but not confirmatory of iron deficiency. So I decided to do some iron studies. So the first thing we look at is the serum iron. And this measures iron bound to the transport protein transferrin but it's not a good test of iron status. And that's the one that the patients will always look at. It's the wrong one to look at. It's highly variable and particularly relevant to our patients. It actually falsely increases with prolonged fasting. And a lot of our patients, so, so anything over 10 hours of fasting will lead to an increase in serum iron. So you'll end up with a false negative result. Transferrin and total iron binding capacity basically measure the same thing. So transferrin is the main protein that transport iron around the circulation, and total iron binding capacity reflects the availability of iron binding sites. So in states of iron deficiency, both transferrin and total iron binding capacity will increase. Now saturation is calculated from iron binding to the transferrin, and usually about 30% of the available iron binding sites are occupied by iron. 
And if this is low, then that actually does suggest iron deficiency. But you have to be careful though, because oral iron supplementation will lead to an increase in the saturation while not being reflective of what's actually happening to the iron stores. So you really should cease oral supplementation for about four weeks before you try and interpret the saturation. Now the best test for iron deficiency is this one, is ferritin. And a low ferritin can confirm an iron deficiency. <coughs> but a high ferritin doesn't necessarily indicate sufficiency. Now there's a lot of debate about what ferritin is considered low. And personally, I tend to see benefits in patients if we manage their iron with a ferritin, any ferritin below about 50. But you can see the reference range here would accept down to 15, and I think that's too low. Now the major problem with ferritin is that's what we call an acute phase reactant. Its levels actually increase with inflammation. And this makes good sense because many bacterium require iron and sequestering the iron away from the bacterium actually will impair their growth. And that, that's a good defensive strategy. Unfortunately, the body actually reacts in the same way to other inflammatory stimuli besides an infection. So if you have an autoimmune disease, your body will treat that as though you have an infection and it will sequester this iron away. So ferritin being this where iron is stored will actually elevate, but the body can't access that for its physiological functions. So in essence, it's starvation in the land of plenty. You've got enough iron, you just can't access it. And that's why if you have a elevated ferritin, that doesn't mean that your body's able to use the iron. And it's also worth noting that liver injury can also influence our iron markers. And that's basically due to, similar to what we saw with the, uh, the hemolysis of the red blood cells, damage to the hepatocytes can leak their contents and that often gives the appearance of iron overload. So if somebody comes in with an elevated ferritin and it looks like they're overloaded, make sure you have a look at their liver markers. And quite often, once we f when we fix the liver, uh, the ferritin will fall dramatically. Now, as I said before, ferritin's an acute phase reactant. And that leads to a false elevation of ferritin. But in addition, inflammation will also reduce our iron absorption. So, and that leads to a real fall in our iron. And here in this study, as we go along the horizontal axis, you can see where CRP is increasing by decile. And you can see that as CRP rises, absolute ferritin stores actually fall. So there's a double whammy. So, and this is actually even worse than it looks because remember that ferritin is probably falsely elevated. So the, the real picture is probably worse than suggested. So let's have a look at some of the non-standard tests for iron deficiency. And one of the tests that's thought to be better for assessing iron deficiency if you have concurrent inflammation is soluble transferrin receptor. So basically this is a truncated version of the tissue transferrin receptor which circulates in the plasma. And it's a very good marker for marrow erythropoiesis, basically the creation of red blood cell production. And it usually is significant elevated in the case of iron deficiency, except Inflammatory cytokines inhibit erythropoiesis. And that leads to a reduction in soluble transferrin receptor. So again, in the state of inflammation, soluble transferrin receptor may not accurately determine functional iron status. Another test that we can use, and this one is actually available through Medicare, which is a disappointment because it's really not that useful. <laughs> So most protoporphyrin in our red blood cells actually has iron at its centre. But if you have an iron deficient state, that can be replaced by zinc. And this protoporphyrin is totally useless because it can't bind to iron. Unfortunately though, depending on what particular cutoff is used, it will either lack sensitivity, specificity or both. And I personally don't find zinc protoporphyrin to be a useful test. But uh, just while we're talking about zinc, just a couple of points on supplementation. Zinc deficiency has been associated with increased symptomatology 
in iron deficiency. And this includes things like restless legs and depression and fatigue. So for that reason, a lot of patients with iron deficiency will be supplemented with zinc. Here's the problem. Regular and sustained supplementation with zinc can compete with iron for absorption and can actually worsen iron deficiency. So what I like to do, I recommend supplementing with zinc on alternate days to iron. So remember, they both compete together. So if somebody's taking a high-dose zinc every day, recommend that they take it no more than every second day.